Hello everyone. You now know that the best way to treat a patient with macular edema is to induce EGFR stimulation by removing the Muller cell hand fit during the ILM peeling. Here are some surgical tips to make your surgery easier and to avoid complications. Because this is my philosophy, to do perfectly what is necessary to do while avoiding everything that is not essential, which could complicate the gestures and increase surgical trauma. I really think that the simpler a surgery is, the closer you get to the truth. So, of course, simplicity is not always synonymous with ease. But I actually believe that the fewer instruments you get into the eye, the less complications you will have and the shorter your surgery will be, and the better the functional recovery will be. Be careful, surgery is not a race, and experience shows that it is better to have well-controlled and therefore slow gestures, rather than to go fast and repeat an imperfect gesture. All those who came and see me in my operating room can testify that my gestures were excessively slow, but that they, this did not prevent me from doing 13 ILM peeling from 8.30 in the morning to 1 p.m. and in a single room, in a single operating room, with seven minutes of cleaning the room between each operation. All the strategic choices I'm going to present you are therefore based on these principles. And let's start with the illumination. The 17 to 18,000 ILM peeling I made during my career in Nantes were made under the sole illumination of the slit lamp of the operating microscope. I have not used an optical fiber more than 10 times for this type of surgery, and I never understood why there are not more operators outside France and Japan to use the slit lamp for macular surgery as it has so many advantages. First, the surgeon's left hand, so if he is right-handed, of course, is free. Which cataract operator would be willing to sacrifice his left hand to all the fiber illuminating his surgical fields. He naturally considers his microscope as a combined visualization and illumination system to practice a bimanual surgery, you, just as you hold your fork and knife after turning on the kitchen ceiling light. Okay, let's be honest. For ILM peeling, you don't need to hold the membrane with one hand to cut it off with the other, but the free hand can make peripheral scleral depression if you decide to perform a complete vitrectomy, center the plano concave lens, turn the wheel of the forceps to present the jaws perpendicular to the edge of the membrane, and spatially stabilize the forceps to avoid trembling movements and then increase the precision of the work. What do you do when you play Mikado with a child? You hold your arm with your other hand to increase your precision. The surgeon precision increases, he appears very skilled, never making retinal touch, and the surgery becomes faster. 
So you're going to tell me that you can also free your left hand by placing a chandelier. It's true. But I see three disadvantages to the chandelier compared to the slit lamp. First, you will increase the cost of the procedure. Second, if you do a peripheral vitrectomy, the scleral depression will push the chandelier against the lens and cause a cataract. And finally, your chandelier will create too small incarceration as has been demonstrated in endoscopy. With the slit lamp, firstly you save time, the lighting of the slit of the microscope pedal being instantaneous, and finally you do only two sclerotomies at 11 o'clock at noon without traction caused by the movement of the intraocular fiber and without risk for the lens. You will therefore perform surgery not only faster but also less invasive. The fact that it is a slit, thus making an optical cut of the transparent tissue, is less useful than in retinal detachment surgery, but you will be able to identify where the posterior haloid is, as well as the posterior capsule, very useful if you want to remove the anterior haloid without touching it. Finally, the fact that the light source is always 200 mm from the retina makes the risk of phototoxicity is almost zero. This risk, you know it, is proportional to the square of the distance and when you go from 16 to 4 or even 2 mm of the retina, you increase this risk by 16 or even 64. Moreover, the light slit passes through the corneal and crystalline filters, which further decreases its toxicity. So just a few quick installation tips. If you have the Zeiss integrated slit lamp, you do, no, do not have much to choose because the illumination angle is fixed. You will choose just the width of the slot. Personally, I was choosing a little wider when I wanted to make a video. And the right or left size where you want it to be placed. Some choose the right side for the right eye and the left side for the left eye. Personally, I was always choosing the right size as well as for my office biomicroscope for video reasons because the camera was always placed on the left. If you have a mobile external lamp under the body of the microscope, in addition to the width and the side choices, you will have to choose the illumination angle. I advise you to place it between 5 and 7 degrees from the axis of the microscope. To do this, I recommend the following technique. You put the lowest magnification of the microscope and bring the lamp from the outside toward the central axis. When you see the prism cover of the lamp, in the corresponding ocular, you have the right angle. Of course, as soon as you increase magnification, you will not see this cover any longer. Last tip. Unlike an antraocular fiber, slit lamp lighting does not follow the movements of the eye of your patients. It is therefore essential that the patient iris is perfectly horizontal, perpendicular to the axis of illumination. You will therefore be careful before starting the procedure to check the position of the patient's head and you will often need to lower the head rest. So be careful to choose a thin 
headrest so that you can move your legs freely under the headrest of the operating table if it is lowered. Finally, I see two disadvantages to the slit lamp. The first is the width of the illuminated field. I fully understand that for the treatment of retinal detachment or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, a surgeon wants, especially at the beginning of the career, to control what happens in the peripheral uh, of the retina, in the, in the retinal periphery during the entire procedure. But there, in eye lamp peeling, it's really not the main concern. And as long as you use a high magnification of the microscope to have a better precision of the gestures, the illuminated area will occupy almost the whole field. The second disadvantage that explains why I had to use a fiber 10 times out of 18,000 is that the light beam must go through the cornea and the pupil in both directions, unlike intraocular illumination system where the light only goes in the direction of return. A big guttata or a very tight meiosis can cause, can cause diffractions in both directions and you can exceptionally be better with an intraocular fiber or a chandelier. So, all that considered, I think that the slit lamp illumination of the microscope is, for this surgery, the most suitable system. So, of course, there is a learning curve, especially to remove reflection when the plano-concave lens is not positioned correctly, but is no more difficult than learning to operate in inverse vision and imagine again once all the advantages that it provides. Shorter, cheaper, less sclerotomy, less vitreoretinal carceration, less risk of traction and crystalline injury, more surgical precision, less phototoxicity. That makes still not bad, no? Let's go now to the viewing lens. As far as the viewing lens are concerned, the choice that is offered to the operator is to privilege either the 360 degrees of a view or the quality of the image. You cannot have both. When we talk about macular surgery, it seems to me that the choice is quickly made and that it is the quality of the image that must be preferred and this leads us to exclude large angle lenses. No photographer wanted to make a close and sharp portrait will take a wild field lens. It is so obvious that it's even painful to try to convince those who do not understand it. I prefer to demonstrate uh, through a true experience. The biome cell representative came and see me on day, one day, as I was the first to use the large field lens in France, but also because he had a special lens giving the best image quality for macular surgery. So I, I tried it and we recorded the images. Since the biome was not compatible with the slit lamp, we used intraocular fibers. First, by placing a single disposable plano concave lens and you can see the small vitreous fibers attached to the macula.
and then he installed the biome himself, placed his high-definition lens and made the focus himself so that there were no discussion and you can see the difference. All the vitreous fibers are invisible because the separating power of a wide-angle lens is obviously not so good. If we put the two images next to each other, it is obvious. Then, some operators aware of this place a plano concave lens uh, the time of the dissection but keep the large angle system for the time of the vitrectomy. Why not? But what a waste of time and money. If you work with a slit lamp, your second hand is free to manipulate the plano concave lens and allow you to view the entire periphery. You do not have the need to place a lander swing to fix the lens in the middle. Beside the time to place the ring and the conjunctival damage to fix it, the big disadvantage that I find is precisely that it does not allow the lens to move on the cornea. Let me explain. If you can't control the position of your lens on the cornea, you can use the prismatic effect produced by its anterior surface. Take an example. You are having scleral depression during peripheral vitrectomy. The patient's eye is tilted toward your depression. If you assist and drops the lens, you will have vision from the anterior retina to the macula. If he or her uh, raises the lens upward you, you will have the peripheral vision up to the ciliary body. So no need for prismatic lens. Thanks to the operating slit lamp, I no longer needed a prismatic lens and if during surgery I wanted for one reason or another to check the periphery with a free mirror lens, no need to remove the lander's ring. You see, as a simple detail, the use of the slit lamp can have a whole cascade of repercussions and simplify all the needs in material and all the gestures. Let's see now the choice of gauge. When I stopped operating in 2016, the 27 gauge did not exist. I also did not use the 25 gauge regularly for the simple reason that there were not, at the time, 25 gauge sharp peak to initiate a plan of cleavage when the posterior haloid covers the posterior pole. I found it absurd having to change the kit during the operation to move to a wider gauge if uh, I had to deal with this problem. I believe that now it exists and it is therefore likely that for macular surgery I would use 25 gauge despite a longer vitrectomy time, greater flexibility of the instrument and a worse grasping effect of different forceps. But I think that in general the choice of gauge is less important for the operator than for the laboratory that markets them and that it is not necessary by a fashionable effect to operate less well or in a less controlled way for the sole reason of using smaller openings. Thank you.